What's up, bubs? It's Coco Dope, and I'm back with another Dope Talk, uh, my little podcast for hosting people with dope talents. Let's give a warm welcome to the spelunker of facts and a close friend of mine, <laughs> Frederick Knudsen. Yay. Yay. Hello, everyone. You gotta add clapping. You gotta, uh, you gotta like, make it. No, just, just yeah. add it in post. <laughs> okay. Well, see, I'm not that smart. I, I still got to work on my uh, my YouTube etiquette. The, I have to, you know, make it seem like I'm cool. So I just add in like a few different people in the background, and they're all like, "Yeah, great job, awesome." I'll just hire some of those famous YouTube actors uh, with my no budget. So uh, <laughs> yeah, like you, Fred... the Fousey Tube. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> So, so without wasting more time, uh, I guess, I guess, would you like to introduce yourself, Fred? Yeah, sure. Hello, I'm Frederick Knudsen. I'm the creator of a show called Down the Rabbit Hole on YouTube, a series of documentaries um, done in the sort of Ken Burnsian style. Um, yeah, that's my shtick. Yeah, well, um, to, to, to kind of further enunciate, I would even say Fred's kind of this guy who covers all sorts of, I don't even know where to begin with it. It started with lol cows, and then it just kind of expanded into its own universe. <laughs> I, I, I figure it's just whatever kind of interests you at the time, but Fred's kind of like this uh, owl-esque documentary uh, deep diver of, of both the internet and, and the world. And I, I would say I found his content because of that. Like, it's just so much uh, interesting stuff on his channel and stuff that I would have never taken the time to research. You know when you go into, like, Wikipedia and you, you just, like, start <laughs> clicking on new articles and you just kind of get into the <laughs> the weirdest places? That's kind of like watching Fred's videos, I'd say. It's really fun to research a topic that has a Wikipedia article and then dig deeper into it and be like, wow, this is it, it. It's not like the information on Wikipedia is wrong most of the time. It's just it misrepresents the topic so often. Yeah, I mean, well, we were talking about how that one guy is like responsible for like 90 percent of the Wikipedia. Articles. Yeah. And, and <laughs> so... that man is a blessing. Yeah, he's he's a good boy, but also probably not the smartest with every subject unless he spends all his time reading up on like uh, small plumbing issues and then like the ambassador <laughs> of like Eurasia and all that crap, you know. <laughs> Maybe he is. Maybe I should be interviewing him instead of you, Fred. Ah, shit. Well, <laughs> Well, See you guys next time. Guys. Yeah. On the, no, I won't. Maybe not. A, no. Well, I guess I guess uh, we'll have to deal with that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I I guess kind of getting into it, like, what got you started on the whole scene uh, with, with your documentary stuff? Oh shit! All right, you want you want the long version? You want like the the rabbit hole version because it starts somewhere completely different. Uh, yeah, no, I figure I figure deep diving because like whenever I talk to people, I always like to see kind of like where they started like from not necessarily with their career, but kind of the the events that led up to to whatever it is like hell that you've unleashed on Earth. So so yeah. go forth. No, it it it's really a weird place. When I was in college, I was very interested in being a competitive gaming caster. I wasn't terribly interested in playing, but I quite enjoyed watching esports. And particularly, I was enamored with the idea of being the caster and helping guide people along you know, what was going on in the game at any given moment. Um, and I sort of carved out a name for myself in the League of Legends community. Oh, that, that, oof, f that, that game. Um, <laughs> no! <laughs> but... I, I carved out a name for myself as a play-by-play -play caster who could talk very quickly and keep up with the action really well, um, almost in the style of a boxing radio host. And that was really fun. Um, but as time went on, you know, I got tired of League of Legends, and then I also noticed that League of Legends had sort of divided itself to the people who were in on, like, the Riot sponsor stuff and the people on the outside, and unfortunately I was just shy of that line. So I moved on from League, went and played like competitive Guns of Icarus for a little while, started casting that when they needed a caster. I went from game to game to game. Um, and then finally I joined up on Gigantic. And anyone who's seen uh, Shammy's video on um, Overwatch and, um, what was it, Paladins, uh, knows about the fate of Gigantic and how ill-fated it was. But I was very involved with Gigantic. They would even fly me out to events. They flew me out to a couple of events. Uh, to present the game, I was poised to be like the one of the main casters of that game, 
and they asked me, hey, would you be interested? Now we're actually getting to the down the rabbit hole part. Don't worry. Mm. <laughs> they asked me, hey, Fred, would you be interested in applying for a community role, a like public relations role? I'd be like, yeah, okay. Uh, do you want to, like, I'm guessing you want to see video work. And they're like, yeah, definitely. Um, and that's when I realized I hadn't made a video in years. I spent a lot of my high school in uh, studios and editing bays. So I had a, I had a lot of experience uh, producing videos. But I hadn't made one in years because I'd been casting. That's where all my energy was going outside of college. And I thought, what do I even make? Well, I mean, I got to show off my voice and my editing abilities. Fuck it, I'll make a documentary. Um, what should I make the documentary on? Well, you know what? Nobody's made a video about digital homicide studios. Like, all the information is scattered, and it's almost impossible to piece together what the hell went on and why they sued Jim Sterling for over a million dollars. Yeah, was was, the, was this, like, pre-Jim Sterling, or was this, like, after that kind of caught your attention? Um, this was post-Jim Sterling. Like, this was okay. after he'd been sued. Um, and I cover that in the video. And I throw together the video in three days. Literally one day for research, one day for writing, one day for narration and editing. And it was a nightmare. I'd hardly slept. And I never heard back from them. Because the studio was, uh, the game studio was undergoing really, like, terrible financial issues and they shuttered really quickly afterward. And, and we all know how Gigantic ended up <laughs> in the, uh, mm -hmm. the inevitable trash heap, unfortunately. All of my was... favorite games die. All of my favorite competitive games die. Hawken, Fractured Space, Gigantic, just everything I touch dies. Oh, it's no, really Fred. <laughs> But I mean, you know, in that case, League of Legends, uh, I guess you got to go back to them because personally, I don't <laughs> see it going. <laughs> that no, that game died a long time. The game that I knew as League of Legends died a long time ago. Oh, yeah, no, it's it's like a corpse on life support with uh, glittery Disney characters <laughs> all over it. <laughs> anyway, um, so I never heard back from the game studio, but Jim Sterling discovered my video. I, I I specifically posted it on the Jim Sterling subreddit because I'm like, ah, you know what, I'll post it up here. Maybe a couple of people would like it. And Jim Sterling saw it and retweeted it. And he got me my first few thousand subscribers because they really enjoyed it. And it just kind of snowballed from there. I realized, hey, wait a minute, people really like what I'm making. And I'm pretty good at finding topics and digging into topics and researching them. Um, where other people have difficulty and when, where there's been nothing that brings these topics into one cohesive whole. And so I decided to go all in on it. And it paid off. That's uh, that's quite a mouthful. <laughs> but no, it's it's kind of cool that you, you went for one thing and then it completely like just went in a different direction because you decided, hey, you know, I'm doing this already. Why the hell am I not just like doing it for myself? I mean, I don't know. I I think your first couple of videos were a fantastic start, and uh, we all kind of know <laughs> what, what you covered <laughs> after that. Uh, I was, you know. I was gonna, oh, hmm? sorry. Go ahead. No, I was I was gonna start asking kind of about the the coverage that you get into because like you know you started with digital homicide and then quickly spit rolled into Chris Chan and then from there it's like there is almost no cohesion to the topics you would cover but <laughs> you would still give them all the same kind of dissonant treatment like I I want to talk about these disturbing things but I also want to keep it very professional <laughs> you know <laughs> well so like yeah keep going well. I noticed that with Digital Homicide Studios, the thing that really frustrated me was every time I tried to learn about, like, what was going on with Digital Homicide Studios, the only videos I could find and the only articles I could find were really biased. And that's not to say that I don't have bias myself, right? Like, everyone yeah. has their own level of bias. But I thought that I could do it in a way that actually captured all of the information. Like, obviously, my Digital Homicide Studios, if you go back and watch that video, it's obvious that I was, like, poking fun at them the whole time. But I was more interested in making sure that all the information was there. And it turns out nobody does that shit. Like, I, I seem to be the, like, at least at the time, I was one of the very few people who was doing something like that. 
And I was able to find enough topics where this was happening that um, I had an endless supply of potential topics. You, so you start spit rolling between like what Chris Chan and uh, Mother Horse Eyes and uh, what's that one guy Dargar the the dude who does all like Henry, Henry Darger. Darger. Uh, what what kind of in in your eyes decides the coverage that you want to go after because like that's that's a hell of a repertoire you got. <laughs> um, this has kind of been like my little secret for a while, but I'll I'll go ahead and spoil it. Um, there are a lot of factors that go into choosing what I'm going to do for a topic. One of them is that there has to be a story. Um, because down the rabbit hole is basically story time, but in real life. And certainly a, a level of um, obscurity and darkness helps. There's um, Because something I discovered is that no matter what I'm doing, even if I'm doing something lighthearted, it ends up being creepy anyway or sounding creepy. It's not intentional. I swear to God. But I roll with it, right? And so I, I started picking topics more and more. The, the goal of uh, the series has changed over time. I uh, started with things I was just interested in and I, and I thought were weird, and then I started to narrow in on what I um, thought was good. So it started out with, you know, just there's got to be a story, and then um, it ended up turning into a much broader idea. Specifically, I'm interested in the ideas of postmodernism, and the concept of, like, people have their own perspectives on reality. And it is, I contend that while it's uncomfortable, it is still interesting to see and engage with the realities of other people. That, <laughs> I, just, I, I appreciate that you kind of uh, bring it in, because there is kind of a weird sense of people denying reality with a lot of the people that you cover. I mean, like, you have Darger, and then Homicidal, and then uh, Chris Chan. Going back to them, oh boy. No, it's just like... Yeah, ins- I, <laughs> you keep almost asking this question. I know. I, I think I know what the question is going to no, be. No, I just Go like ahead. I keep bringing it back to it because <laughs> there's like this this topic of insanity. I mean, obviously not with the hurdy gurdy, but like you you always tend to to find these people who are in a very bad headspace, and you bring it into like a way that you can kind of almost comprehend that despite the insanity. So I was I was gonna ask like did you did you intentionally ever start this series uh, thinking that you'd kind of like farm lull cows or, or was it like you wanted to branch it out? I guess. <laughs> so it was the opposite actually. I recognize that, all right, down, people really like down the rabbit hole. I think I've got some people that will keep coming back, and I can grow this if I just keep working at it. So from the very beginning, I was thinking about the long term. And I recognize that, ugh, like, Chris Chan was something that really horrified me, and I knew that people were going to want that. So my initial thought was, I'm, people are going to want this bad enough that I'm going to have to do it eventually. I'm just going to get it out of the way and then never have to, like, touch this kind of topic again. (laughs) And (laughs) it obviously went in an extremely different direction. Yeah, um, I I just, to me, it's it's really weird that you just kind of jump from from, uh, piece to piece. Um, but it, it also makes it an interesting listen because I never really know what to expect from you on a, on a, you know, month by month basis, whenever you post new content. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting that you bring a lot of, uh, I guess topics that people wouldn't normally, you know, have, have a full grasp on. At least for me, it makes, um, the insanity of, of uh, people like the the Tempo OS, OS guy, like it brings it into a digestible format that I can enjoy without having to go through forums and forums of just absolute insanity. <laughs> well, that part of the inspiration was that uh, part of the inspiration for Down the Rabbit Hole, I should say, is that pretty much anyone talking about these sorts of obscure topics always ends up going on tangents or like they're not skilled at putting together um this sort of information in in a digestible way. And that's something that, you know, I went to college for, and I I recognized that there was a gap for this kind of thing because people would end up, you know, spending hours researching these people because they were so fascinated. But it took forever because nobody had either the will or the capability 
to put it into one big cohesive whole or they were a content creator that already was based around their ego and so it was always bogged down with what they immediately thought they always had to add you know their own thoughts on it and there's something to be said for that kind of media it's not a bad form of media but there's a lot of it and i recognized that i could stand out if i did the opposite if i took it it um if i took the approach of an essay where i am trying to get as much information as possible in as small of a space as possible and then combine that with my video experience and put it all into one cohesive format um, that could be enjoyed in, into something enjoyable. It's it's interesting. I, I always I mean, you say you're kind of unbiased, but there's always these little brief moments I notice in your videos. <laughs> yeah, like that, like that, that, that's something I want to say is like when I say that other people are very biased, like I'm. If you if you if you read between the lines of my videos, I'm quite biased, right? E everyone will end up coming in with their but, own. But but it's like this small kind of bias. I almost call it like a Fredism. Whenever like I hear you rip on someone <laughs> in the most subtle way possible, and it's like it's it's an it's kind of like a passive aggressive <laughs> use of a word. Like the, I I can't remember what it was specifically, but it's like moments where you're like, understandably, <laughs> it's like whoa, <laughs> yeah. Or, or the uh, the other video where you're talking about medieval P, uh, people shaking their booty, kind of like twerking, but like not necessarily saying yeah. such. <laughs> shaking their bottoms, excuse me. Um. Yeah, it's <laughs> I, I spend a few minutes considering how best to phrase that sentence. Uh, yeah, I just, well, I think I think you know something I notice whenever I'm talking to Fred, and he's a close buddy of mine. We we have a lot of conversations, but there's moments. Oh yeah, yeah. Our, like the way our friendship started. You want to explain how well, that happened? Well, <laughs> you know, uh, like okay. To start with, I was trying to talk about something completely different, and you had to take it into that territory. I was just gonna mention that um, whenever I'm talking to Fred, most times he'll say a word, and I have to ask him for like the specific definition, and most times I will forget it. And this is not. I'm not the only person who's dealt with this. Fred's just a. Uh, baby boy genius who spend a lot of time on thesaurus.com at least in my opinion <laughs> but i was gonna talk I, I guess mention how this started so like most people uh who become my friends i uh reached out to them to i guess get them on the dope talk podcast and in that process it's usually like i'll kind of get to know them a lot more um and and you know in a in a way get to consider them a close friend like that happened with you know Nightmind. that happened with uh brutal moose who, who's not on my podcast but should be on at some point um and a few others but <laughs> the thing that happened with fred was he caught me at probably a time in my life where i could not do that so i was like hey fred want to be in my podcast and he's like absolutely and i was just like great and then a year later, I was like, hey, Fred, maybe you should be on my podcast now and my life's not falling apart. <laughs> so here we are today uh, interviewing Fred literally a year after I asked him to do this. Although he was a fucking sweetheart. Like the second like I asked him, he's just like, yes, please let me on. I would love to do that. I was worried Fred would like hate me or something. But apparently uh, it's the exact opposite because <laughs> he stuck around. Um Back on topic, though, I uh, I was going to ask, <laughs> what kind of topics would you want to touch on in the future? Because you just kind of went left field with your with your most recent video about the, the hurdy-gurdy. Yeah, the hurdy-gurdy was something I wanted to cover last year. I pretty much covered everything that I really wanted to cover. I had, like, like, half a year planned out, and now I'm all the way through that. And I actually need to refill that queue. Um, I already have one topic that I know I'm going to do that I'm saving for October that's going to be a sort of Halloween-ish episode. Um, not explicitly so. It's not going to be like, oh, I'm watching this in the summer and this is Halloween-themed. Well, this is awkward. Um, but uh, I... <sighs> the topics for my videos have changed over time a lot. Um, specifically what I want to cover, what works, um, because I've only been at this for like two years. Jeez, <laughs> it's, and and I'm still, I'm I'm still um, sort of discovering where my strengths lie, and with every video I experiment a little bit. With each topic um, I choose, I'm experimenting a little bit, um, to try to find what really fits the best. And there are some places where like small things haven't worked here or there, but every time you know I keep discovering things that do work really well. Um, 
No, I'll like I'll I could definitely go in a little bit more about how I like how I choose my topics and what topics well, I cover because like like I said, you know, Chris, like it's been an, a process of experimentation. I did Chris Chan just to get them out of the way, and then um, it turned out that like that turned out really well, um, partially because I was one of the few people not explicitly making fun of Chris online. And I think that it resonated with people. And when I recognize it's like, hey, wait a minute, I have an opportunity to like talk about this, but in an empathetic way that is still that that still acknowledges the not so Qualities. great yeah. aspects. Uh, yeah, um, like just an honest look at it. What I was what I was going to say is I find it interesting that you say like two years uh, to you is like almost still in your infancy despite the fact that you've done tremendously well uh like you're almost at half a million subs right now and that's crazy for a channel just starting out but i think you've just defined such a niche genre and you have such a well-spoken voice that like it it kind of pays for itself like you can see why why you've built this kind of a following um I was, I was going to ask particularly what kind of developed your style because you know there's the uh the sense that you have this documentary and kind of an editorial with like a little bit of empathy, like what brought you to be almost very dry in your delivery of the, the, the subjects you cover? I've thought about this and I think it's because of my upbringing. I didn't have cable or satellite growing up. We, we never had it in the house. And so I grew up watching a lot of PBS and one of my favorite shows on there was Nova and uh, but I also, you know, I ate up stuff like Nature, like in any of these documentaries um, that was on PBS, I would watch and I'd enjoy them and I'd soak up everything. And I came to really appreciate and enjoy just whenever I'm consuming media, I'm like growing and learning and experiencing things. And sometimes it was dry, but I really enjoyed that dryness. It's it's very strange. I don't know. It's like the hidden Englishman in me. But I think that, that there's a lot of affection I have for that sort of uh, content and video and documentary. And the more I watched it, the more I wanted to emulate it. There's actually, um, I'm still trying to find it. It's hidden away somewhere. Maybe. I might still have it. But it was a documentary on, uh, in, in my film class, we were told to make a documentary. And... I decided, no, I was with my group and we all decided that we were going to cover our local public transit system. <laughs> yeah, so this is a little bit of an aside, uh, but this was sort of my first foray into making uh, documentary content. That's, uh, we'll keep so, going. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have eaten just before I recorded the podcast, so I have to mute myself every wow, so Fred, often. Wow, Fred, that's gross. You're disgusting. How dare you? How dare you be a human being? I'm muting on, myself. On my podcast. <laughs> that is I, disgusting. Uh, I, I t put it on the record that Fred farts a lot. That is mm -hmm. not true. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I don't know if I believe that or not. <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. Fred's a very <laughs> clean boy. You've roomed oh, yeah, with me. You know, we'll get to that. We'll we'll get that's that's uh, on the menu for later tonight, Fred. Not <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so. Anyways, oh, no, we'll keep so going. anyway, um, I end up doing most of the project because I'm one of the few people like in that group who had like experience doing a lot of editing and was in the studio and. I think also one of them, she like she wasn't terribly like engaged with it. Um, so one of them went out um, into town and recorded footage, and I wrote the script, uh, recorded the narration, and did the editing. And I decided to use Mass Effect music for it. And when it finally came time to screen it for the whole class, someone raised their hand, and like it, it was a very memorable experience for me. They raised their hand and said something like. Now I feel like our local public transit is going to take over the world. And then everyone in the room just went, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's, it's kind of 
So oh, it, <laughs> I, I grew up with it and then want, started wanting to emulate it. Basically. I still think it's kind of cool that it started like that early on. And I don't know, there's there's always that kind of weird charm. A lot of people I noticed like with with the earlier YouTube content, kind of when like the whole uh, Game Grump scene was starting, they would use like video game music as like copy free royalty stuff, even though I don't think technically it's like, you know, without mm. copyright. But getting around that, <laughs> adding yeah. a different interesting uh, <laughs> yeah. kind of vibe to it um hmm i was gonna ask uh i I should have put this earlier but in your in your experience uh doing coverage i guess of more recent people and events have you ever had any sorts of run-in with the people that you've discussed uh via via their content (laughs) <laughs> you know oh, the fucking well, I know, answer to this I know, I know shit. one, but you know, if you want to talk about it a little bit, friend. <laughs> okay, so this past summer, um, the mm-hmm. last summer, I went to Too Many Games mm-hmm. to give a talk. That actually is, um, that, that's, there's a little story behind the Furries episode. That, um, that is actually the reason that I did the Furries episode down the rabbit hole. But while I was there, it turned out that Christine Weston Chandler was also in attendance. In fact, she'd gotten invited by one of the higher-ups. And literally, like, the night, or I I think it was, like, the the day after, people started coming up to me and being like, hey, Fred, did you know that Chris is here? I was like, no, I I, I didn't. And and then they'd be like, are are you going to go see her? I was like, why the fuck would I want to? (laughs) I want like I I want to stay as detached from my topics as possible. Why why would I want to? Wh- and then, no. And then uh, as soon as you did your panel, they're like, "Hey, friend, did you know Chris was here and isn't coming back?" And you're like, "Oh no." <laughs> yeah. So while I was setting up for my panel, uh, that that is when Chris had her meltdown in the middle of like the convention. And I didn't even get the chance to see it because I was busy setting up for my panel and delivering it. Apparently, she was dragged out the door right past (laughs) my (laughs) my, uh, conference room. And and we all missed it. I was at Fred's panel, actually, when he was doing the furry presentation. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, it was pretty fantastic. That room was packed. It was... uh... It was cool to see that many people at a gaming convention interested in hearing about furries. We even had somebody in a fursuit show up, which was pretty pretty good timing, if, if you ask me. But... Oh yeah, wearing a shirt that said "Thick Thighs, <laughs> yeah, thick save, thighs lives. save Lives," and uh, we we got we got in contact with him. It was a pretty good time. But I was I was actually specifically talking about um, the dude who wrote uh, Empress Teresa because I I believe they contacted you also. <laughs> um, not directly. That uh, so a a while ago I had a much more active uh, fan Discord server. Um, the I I didn't really have much of a hand in managing it. One of the mods there decided to email Norman Bouton a link to my live stream that I did covering his book. And he just kind of had some funny words about it. And then he wrote a response on his website about it. There, it's Most of my interactions, in fact, all of my interactions with uh, the subjects that I've covered have been very distant, obviously excluding the yeah. Birdie Gertie. But that's like the closest Would I've gotten. Would you say the uh, the response though? Did it was it like kind of creepy that like something almost came super close to you, or w- was it more like kind of a humorous uh, th- feeling? <laughs> Norman is completely mm-hmm. harmless. I I'm convinced that he can't really take care of oh, himself oh no. even. So, I, I he's living with okay, family. Well, I believe. <laughs> so he yeah, like his family has to take care of him, but. I, I I wasn't worried in the slightest in that case. I, I, I don't think I've ever been, like, too concerned. I try to be, like, tactful in my videos, but also tactical about what I choose. Gotcha. Um, hmm. I'm trying to see if there's any other, like, questions in particular I have set for, for at least my part. Because, like, the, the Q&A, it actually has a pretty palpable um, feeling for a lot of the other stuff I wanted to get into. Uh, so I think, All right. with that being said... Uh, I, I'm actually going to move it to the Q&A section, and this is where I get to talk about all the stuff that you guys asked, and I get to harass... Oh, be- yeah. before we before we slide into that, I, I almost forgot uh-huh. to mention, 
I, I wrote a really mediocre book a while ago and I put it up on Amazon and after Norman discovered that my book existed, he decided to leave a one star oh. review. But this is kind of a funny thing because he always complains about people leaving one star reviews without being verified purchasers of the book. And he did the exact same thing to my book. And when he got called out on it, he deleted the comment, but I have it saved. I have a screenshot saved of it, and I want to frame it. Do you still have, like, the actual, like, message hidden somewhere? Like, you're going to pull that up at some point and put it on your wall as, like, a badge of honor? Yes. No, I, I have the screen cap oof, on my hard oof, drive. That that sounds like a pretty good time. The only thing that could make that better is if you had an actual, like, signature from the guy. You're like, please sign this. I really, like, uh, appreciate your work. <laughs> like and subscribe everybody I love a signed copy copy of empress Teresa. i i still haven't bought the book i can well, i mean to. you know you could be making his day by buying his book and then you can put that on your shelf proudly uh along all your other uh youtube trophies you know <laughs> <laughs> so anyways before i was so rudely interrupted i'm i'm gonna roll into the q a section yeah Sorry. you know you're not um i'm <laughs> basically uh, i have like a form that, that people can go and fill out uh, you know write a little question and you know incorporate it in the episode and this time we got a we got an interesting slay of questions so i guess i guess to get started with that uh Alla in alice has asked uh how did you come up with with your aesthetic and that kind of ties into your you know the whole editing style but to me like i think what's what's most notable about your <laughs> content and this is pretty much almost every episode is the fucking the music and that kind of like smooth jazz tone throughout it mm -hmm. like just mm -hmm. where did that come from pretty much every bit of the aesthetic of down the rabbit hole has come out of necessity uh, the bare bones aesthetic, the fact that there's so very little, ha it started out because I don't have any experience in graphic design or like 3D modeling or even like After Effects. So like all of my time um, was spent, you know, putting the clips together in, a, in an aesthetically pleasing way. And instead of trying to teach myself to do something and do it mediocre, I'm just like, OK, how about I just do what I do well? Um, so that like the bare bones aesthetic is literally just because that's what I know how to do. And I, because I know how to do it, like to a certain degree of skill, uh, like that's what I choose to stay within. And whenever I, I need graphic design, I, uh, get someone else to do that. As for the music, that's Kevin McLeod, man. He, that man has furthered and like enabled so many creators just by making his music available in um, Creative Commons. Which... That man is a blessing. <laughs> and his music is extremely hit and miss, but there's so much of it that you can find what it's you It's really need. funny to me, because like, your, your music is so ingrained in my head as like just part of what you do in your channel. I know it's not yours, but you really own the sort of tone behind it. And, and oftentimes when I watch a YouTube video like from someone else and I hear that music, I feel kind of weird and upset. I'm like, this doesn't feel right listening to this here. <laughs> but no, it's kind of interesting that you, you built it out of a lack of understanding for certain things. Because like most people, I, I feel like they, they get the whole like MS Paint vibe when they <laughs> when they don't necessarily know how to work art assets. I'm very fortunate in the sense that I actually work as an illustrator so i'm like ooh, i can make stuff look fancy maybe my content's a little brain dead but at least i can make like uh, sprinkles on top but <laughs> it's it's cool that you actually found a way to not just make it look like absolute doo-doo you know at, at, at the end of the day and i guess it speaks a lot for people who don't necessarily have a multi facets of uh talents well i mean it's it's, it's just my background mm -hmm. right and I think a lot of people, when they are looking for stock music, they just kind of pick the first thing that they find. And it's a way of going about it. You know, they, they're, they're not worried about the music. They don't, they don't have any experience with it, so they're not even going to think about it. But I recognize, you know, there are a lot of little places where I realized that people were cutting corners that I knew how to do correctly. And so whenever I was picking a piece of music, I was looking at, okay, well, what do I want like what mood do i really want here what's going to accentuate what i'm trying to get and then i would pick my music very carefully i'd spend hours like going through and finding just the right track 
Um, and then, of course, if I need more, I'd like be I'd very carefully loop it so that you you can't even tell that I'm looping the track because I'm stitching it together very carefully. Um, but I, I'm also very particular about how I cut together my voice because, um, you know, almost every sentence or cut like almost every sentence is its own audio clip. But you couldn't tell because I'm like I spend forever trying to like trying to get that really tight and sounding natural. Um one example of this that I'm a little bit proud of is there was a song I really wanted to use in the Empress Teresa video because I felt like the internet commenters who were, you know, like berating him and him fighting them back in a way they needed each other and they were dancing with each other. And so I chose a sort of slow jazz tune. But um, traditionally, I try to avoid horns and violins and that kind of thing because they occupy the same frequency approximately as yeah. a human voice. But I really wanted to use this track. So I went in and just like brought the mids down. And like, so it wouldn't interfere with my voice, um, at least for the section where like I was talking. And then when I brought it back up, I faded it back into another copy of um, the, or another clip of that audio without that um, That's really track kind effects, of uh, that equalization. that you uh, mentioned the timbre of the music is very similar to a voice that you're like trying, you're, you're like on a micro level of understanding how to, how to keep music not distracting from the actual uh, format, like from the voices and from all the, the information that needs to be digested. Like the music's an ancillary property to you. It's, I mean, it's important, right? That's, I recognized when I was starting down the rabbit hole that I had a very specific set of skills, right? And when I, like, I, I recognized that I accidentally had sort of struck something that I could do, like, reasonably well, or at the very least I could make successful because there are very few people that have, um, you know, the experience that I have in the in my particular areas. Like, you know, I spent so much time casting and, like, behind a microphone, but also on stage that I'm really comfortable reading lines and making them sound natural and reading narration. Or, like, you know, being very particular uh, with how I'm reading a script so that I get just the sort of vibe I'm going for. Like, I have experience with that. Um, I have, you know, hours of experience video editing, you know, all through high school. Um... And I, like, my English degree helps my research, and um, it allows me to disseminate information as well, because modern essay writing isn't like, you know, write a 50-page paper, it's write a 50-page paper in 15 pages. So being able to condense information down to its very, uh, like, most basic elements is a was part of my degree, and so I was able to leverage that, um, along with the ability to research and find what I need and explore databases and manipulate those. Um, and I don't think there are very many people who have all of uh, that much experience in all of those particular things. So I just ran with it, and it's, it's why I can get down onto the micro level with all these little things, even with just stock music, is because... I invested the time in it and decided to cobble all of these disparate skills into one particular, like, into one, one product. one Fred chocolate package, one one beautiful nougat or uh, nutit, in your case, of truth. <laughs> nougat. Excuse me, that would have been a lot funnier <laughs> if I had pronounced it right. No, no, I, I hate love it. it. Everybody loves that. They want to <laughs> think of you as a sensual chocolate boy. Anyways... I'm just, I'm just a just, little just truffle. Just a little, just a little baby boy. <laughs> I was, I was gonna move on. You, you really slayed it. So, Alan, Alice, you did a good job. You picked a good question for Fred Boy. Um, Lamar had asked. Wow. Some of your videos deal with very upsetting topics, uh, such as Temple OS, which, yeah, that that guy is absolutely off his rocker. But in in the same sense, you know, he's very, very messed up, and there's there's reasons for it. But but to keep continuing. How do you mentally leverage your research of the topics with the often difficult and or upsetting nature of, of these stories and people? Like, how, how do I deal like, with it personally? I think, I think what, they're, what asking, they're trying to ask like. is, like, how exactly is it that you uh, can digest these things? And, like, is, is it often that you'll, like, do research to a point and find a fact that you kind of find disturbing? Like... Do you, do you find ways to cope with that, or, or does it just never cross your mind that there's, there's like a certain point that, that 
gets passed and it's like kind of the worst you know it's it's a little bit different for every topic because it's never easy covering any of these things because the topics are often extremely disturbing i'm able to sort of when i'm doing the research and i really need to work i'm able to distance myself a little bit um and that sort of distance is important for when i'm trying to get a holistic view of what happened and then i basically say like okay i'm going to get all this information and then i'm going to take a step back and find it but there are definitely the moments that really are struggles are not the moments that you would think they would be Oftentimes it comes after like a lot of research and I've stepped back and then there's like one little moment that so perfectly encapsulates like everything that I've been reading be, it, that brings all of these disparate moments into one cohesive whole. Um, that definitely happened with like the Collier Brothers, which is probably one of the more difficult like videos that I had to make um, with Terry A. Davis there were a few moments where that happened um there the moments like when i was watching the videos of him like yelling at his parents and also where he uh, where he comes out of it for a moment uh, after he's berating his mother and he's like i'm sorry i became hatred for some reason i have to remember like why i forgot that i love you or something like that i can't remember the particular line uh, like what what he said but it was just he he had these moments of clarity and just occasionally they would strike me but often it's um it's not what you'd expect I'm, I'm trying to think of a good example i think with the collier brothers it wasn't even the big moment where i discovered that oh you know he had been crushed um i think it was when i was reading an article written about them um where it started to come together, where he was talking about them living um, in that completely crowded brownstone. And shortly after that, I like nearly broke down, partially for personal reasons, because like my brother and I are very close as well, similar to the Collier brothers. I think I've gotten a little bit off track, uh, but it is very mentally taxing is the short version of this. Uh, I don't think you got off track at all. It kind of really touches on a lot of stuff. I was I was gonna bring it together. Like so, Hinde kind of asked a similar question. Um, they were they were kind of pushing towards the side of has there ever been a discovery during your research that made you consider canceling one of your projects? I've not for any strong negative emotion because usually when I do feel that strong emotion, it just encourages me to share it with people because those little moments where, you know, I find, uh, for example, um, in the Temple OS video where he's, um, where Terry A. Davis is talking about how his bird is looking at his screen and doesn't know what's going on, but he's just doing the best he can with it. Like those moments are beautiful. They're difficult and they're exhausting and emotionally taxing, but they're beautiful. And I want to share them. So when I feel that, it's it's a drive. It's, it's like, I to to me, it's it's like you you see a topic, and I guess I guess why people would be interested in asking that is because you ever wonder if that would get your video shut down just for the kind of uh, negative topics being discussed. Because I know YouTube's very stingy about that. I, I think something that's uh, more worth oh, asking absolutely. is, have you ever been worried um, that the I've, topic you would cover would be I'm shut down I'm less worried about YouTube. it now because YouTube has come out multiple times and said, like, they favor documentary content. In fact, there are some, like, very big documentaries. Like, YouTube is very puritanical about titties. And um, <laughs> they... Yeah, you like that? I... <laughs> I no, no, I, I like the the pronunciation. I think um, I love tits, dude. Everybody what was I emulating? Like I, I think I, I think I think I was I think I was doing Ma and on Sheila there. Um, titties, titties. Um, <laughs> but there are documentaries titties. with plenty of titties, uh, just hanging out there. Um, and because you know, partially probably because they're not uh sexualized, but also because it's documentary, they'll allow it. And so that like. YouTube, be, be, as long as it's, you know, documentary content and yeah. it's untastefully, they're okay with it. Um, 
what I'm more worried about is like other people deciding um, that like they don't want my content up. It, in particular, there was one case where I had to re-upload a video because um, it, it was the Rajneesh Prem video where Osho International, Osho International, which is like the comp uh, the companies that are still alive that Rajneesh founded in India, um, they were trying to silence any sort of negative uh, criticism about them. And so they were copyright claiming uh, news footage uh, that was on YouTube. And I used a couple of clips that they had claimed. And so my video immediately got blocked. Like, it wasn't even copyright claimed or anything like that. It was just this video ha contains footage claimed by Osho International. And that, like, it is now blocked in all countries. They're just trying to get people to not look at it. And so I had to use other clips and like carve those out. Yeah, um, I, I had to take down the video. Um, so you had to repost cut together the video a new entirely, version without or... those clips and re-upload it. Oh, oh my god! I it sucks because they're really interesting clips. They're good clips, but I'm sorry to hear that <laughs> they weren't essential. So I could get around it. That that's that's more what I'm worried about is those kinds of nuisances. Wolfram has asked, what exactly is the process of picking a video? Like, how, how do you find the videos that you want to cover? And then how long does, like, the research kind of take you? Like, how far down do you go before you say, this is a video that I'm definitely going to make? Yeah, when I have a topic that I, like, a lot of the topics, especially early on, were just things that I knew about and had learned about by hanging around online. They, they get mentioned. Um... But when I think I have a topic with potential, I s will spend anywhere between like 15 minutes and an hour sort of skimming the surface and seeing what information I can find. And if if I determine that there is enough that like is going to keep me busy for a, for a little while, that's going to take some serious research and um, is go that I believe will garner something substantial. That's when I'll go in. So like it doesn't actually take that long for me to figure out whether a topic is going to be good for down the rabbit hole uh though often i will mull over topics for a long time that's that's kind of interesting i mean i just i like that you actually take the time to look into a topic and you, if you find like an ms paint link <laughs> that like has absolutely one thread it's like a buzzfeed article basically and you're like this is something that happened and you're like you click on it and it's like one sentence that might indicate that something's going on and there's nothing where i like i like that you actually take your time to move past that sort of initial thing and then on top of that I, I think your judgment for finding interesting subjects is is pretty decent like you you know how to brand yourself and this is something i always tell everybody but when it comes to online branding, you kind of have to figure out what it is that works uh, for for your channel or your you know your uh, social media account in the beginning. Like there's there's one number one rule in my opinion, it's consistency, at least in the beginning. Um, when you deliver a product to someone that uh, it they know what to expect from you because you keep doing the same thing, and I don't mean you have to keep making the same thing, but like when you deliver. Uh, similar content on a, on a regular you know schedule people will tend to look back to you because they're like oh i like this one thing they did and, you know if they're doing more things like that that's gonna you know kind of pike my interest i think that's how you kind of started most of your channel is in that same theme of covering sort of insanity you kept going with individuals but over time and this is kind of what i'm getting at is it's good to start branching out because once you build that audience, you, you have more room to, uh, make, uh, I guess more, um, what's the word for it? When, when you have kind of variety, you have, you have more room to kind of stretch your legs and, uh, create some variety and spice in your channel. I always say this to people also is that once you've established a personality, people will tend to come back for that more than just the content. Like if you have an attitude that comes with your content, people will tend to, to revisit it and be like, yes, uh, you might have talked about, <laughs> you know, dumpsters today, but I sure like the way that you covered dumpsters. And that makes it an interesting topic. For you, <laughs> I, I wasn't even going to make that connection. Not that hurdy gurdies and dumpsters are the that. same thing. Or there's... Okay. <laughs> Well, you know, it's a dumpster fire, Fred. But no, like you you covered you covered the hurdy gurdy and then you covered like Neopets and a few other things. And like while those while those might not be in line with what your content is regularly, like, you know, Kafa Kafa, Dark Side Phil, it it definitely resonates with people still because you are bringing 
like that same brand and that same format, but to other things that you might find personally interesting. Um, I, I guess something I would like to ask about that is, do you ever feel like uh, not confident that, that an idea that you might stretch your legs into um, will, will actually hold people's attention? Oh my God. You should have asked that right before I released my newest video. Literally, literally every time like in the 24 hours just before a release of a new video or like 48 hours i'd say i i start getting cold feet and i'm like people are gonna fucking hate this like th this <laughs> people aren't gonna like this like this is this is this this is what's going to lose me my channel people are gonna lose interest and then just leave forever and like this is what's going to ruin my reputation and then you know releases and things are okay <laughs> that Fred, literally I, I every time you. this baby boy stresses about a lot of stuff but i can understand i know a lot of youtubers who are particularly stressed about schedules and making consistent revenue and all that stuff which is it's a very real feeling because once you stop posting consistently or once you get out of that regular schedule that people expect like in your case it's like every couple of months you'll release a video it it becomes kind of worrisome because you can miss out on on the kind of uh, revenue or schedule or even your audience that you, by that point that would be harmful to your channel. It's just good to see that people still respect you for the content you put out, even if it's not the sort of stuff they actually see. Um, I I kind of want to ask you though, do you often find uh, I guess I guess more more in a sense, what would you recommend? to uh people trying to start out with like their own branding like say they have a good idea but like how would you say for them to kind of branch it out into uh, a, a format that people will digest yeah um my first thing that i always tell people like I, i've had a couple of people come up to me and be like how do you get started on youtube the answer is you gotta have something that isn't already being done or they're they're like when you're looking at Let's Players, right? A lot of the big Let's Players, almost all of them that are still around are the ones that were there from the beginning, right? They were the ones yeah. that managed to get in before anyone even really thought it was a thing or like maybe they saw it when it was a tiny thing on a forum and then they're like, all right, well, I'm going to start doing it on YouTube. And just because that content didn't exist yet and there was an unknown demand for it, um, it got really big. And that's what you have to do in the current online landscape. If you're looking to build yourself up, you have to find something that you are good at that is not being done. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, documentaries aren't being done. It's not like what I'm doing is super new. I'm basically a ripoff of Ken Burns. But... <laughs> Nobody was doing it on YouTube and no one, no one was focusing on the sort of topics or themes that I was. Um, and if there were, like, there weren't very many, so there was still a very high demand for it. And a really good way to figure out um, if, what, if your idea is good is, does it exist already? Like, you have, like, the reason, part of the reason that I really wanted to keep going down the rabbit hole and part of the reason that, like, I was so enthusiastic about it is, I wanted the kind of content that I am making now. It just didn't exist yet. And that's a really good, that, that's a good acid test. Is like, can you find what you really, really want? And if not, and if you have the skill to make it, then make it. Because there will be other people that want it. Yeah, um, speaking of that, uh, YouTube, um, if any of you are listening, please do a review of The Dancing Pumpkin, because I, f I, for the life of me, I found one person who reviewed it, and it was probably one of the worst videos I've ever watched in my life. So if you have the time and you like reviewing movies, please, for the love of God, give me <laughs> give me God's best gift to man, uh, the movie called The Dancing Pumpkin. I, I feel like you'd enjoy it yourself, Fred. Not okay. to take away from the incredibly valuable information you've been putting <laughs> out, but I, I need my... My fix <laughs> i need this <laughs> okay anyways getting back on track <laughs> dancing pumpkin um bo the tiger specifically um had had asked uh as someone who has been more recent uh 
excuse me, as someone who has been a more recent inductee, and this is getting into the furry fandom stuff, to the furry fandom and con <laughs> culture, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of, co- there's a lot to cover with this question, but but I'll, I'll keep pushing forward. Oh, dear. How has your experience been so far? Is, is there anything that you uh, see that you wish you could change about the fandom or anything that doesn't make sense to you? And before you even get started, there's a lot to unpack with this question. There is, so, yeah. Fred, as as he mentioned earlier, has uh, he he made a video, uh, basically documenting the uh, early early period of what kind of the furry fandom was and how it really came into popular media. And this goes back to like the '70s, and it was it was a really good video. If if you haven't like watched, it, I would I would give it a good look over because it really kind of brings out this this subculture and kind of where where it came from, but. Fred, I, I don't know why you ended up doing this video in the first place. I know you did that panel about furries uh, at TMG, and I was actually there to watch it and, you know, support Fred. But what started you with that? And I guess we can keep moving forward because there's a lot to this question, like I said. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll start with that. Um, the reason that I did the video on furries was um, I actually did not think that furries would fit the, uh, the channel very well as a topic i felt like it was too broad now at, at that time i was trying to get more and more specific uh with what i was covering and i thought well i'd love to talk about furries so you know what i'm gonna you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna do it as sort of an irregular down the rabbit hole thing i'm going to do it as a panel i'm going to record it and then i'm going to cut it together and um and then i'm gonna post it on my youtube channel and it would be like a live special you know so like a stand-up special but I did not have nearly enough time to cover everything that I wanted to. By the end, I was like rushing through the last points that I wanted to make. Um, and it just wasn't acceptable. The fact that I had to rush through so much, I, there was way more that I needed to cover. Um, you guys should have seen Fred at the uh, convention also, because like he didn't have the right uh, cable to to direct his laptop to yep. the uh, the projector, and so there was a whole deal with that. And Fred, meanwhile, is just freaking out, like trying to try to get ready, and like we're all just trying to help him as best as we could. Um, the one thing that you guys missed, and this didn't end up making it into the video, uh, there was a joke Fred made, where there's a picture of Shadow the Hedgehog. <laughs> Right, and parts of it were, were obscured to say "out the edge," and I, I can't remember what exactly it was, but it, I, he had it, the whole it was room the laughing. it was the furry manifesto. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, oh, I'll, no, I'll no, say no, away no, from... it, it was specifically what? um the bit with the person being like, um, we need to like purify furry, like we need to purify the fandom, and then like talking about you know like all oh, these degenerate people, and then like I had that slowly fade in over like fifteen seconds. So so I guess the the there's the pre fur pock and the post fur pock, but like pre fur pock when you'd done your video and finally released it, um, how did you feel I guess about the whole fandom like looking into it from from kind of an uh, observer's tower? Well, I mean I I had plenty of friends like I, I had some friends that were furries i was or at least were like tangentially furry um and i knew a lot about the culture of it and like i, I knew all about fursuits like what they were at the very least and i knew that furry like i knew that they had a shitty rep that they didn't really deserve if you ask me um so not a lot really changed um the only difference was like i it wasn't even the furries video it was more um like meeting you and nick <laughs> that's what really like i still feel like i'm on the outside looking in a little bit but i mean that's true with everything i've never fit into a group um i, I was one of those people that like in high school i would like consistently you know i'd walk around you'll know, find a place to sit because Uh, The school I went to, the lunch hall wasn't big enough to fit everyone. Like, the school was too small. So everyone just ate in the hallways. And so I'd walk the hallways looking for somewhere to sit. And, like, just random groups uh, would, like, invite me to sit down. But I never never really belonged to any of them. Just sort of skipped between them. And I I feel Um, that same way, like, with Furry, where I'm kind of on the outside. You know, I'm, I'm... they they make cool stuff. I think that the community in general is really cool, but I'm still sort of um still feel like a little bit of an outsider. 
No, it's the same way. Like I, I consider myself I was pretty deep in it for a minute, but like I've come back out and I think I think the best way to enjoy furry as a culture is to uh keep an arm's length from it. Yeah. And it's <laughs> yeah, not that's, that's not that's not saying it's bad, but there's no. definitely a lot of like like any other community out there, there's drama, there's your people who are just kinda trying to stir up shit. But there's something really wonderful about like just just the products that come out of it there's like so many vivid creators um and and people who are like visionaries and even yeah. just people who like they have passions and they all relate over one central topic and so i kind of wanted to introduce fred to that like because you know he, he had already looked into uh a, a, i guess the subject at length and kind of did his research but he had yet to been to a fur con, so I was actually doing GOH, um, which is the guest of honor over at Furpocalypse, uh, one of my favorite cons over in Connecticut. It's actually like around the same weekend as Halloween, um, and I had Nick going already, Nick Nocturne, and I uh, I knew Fred, and I was like, all right, Fred, look, we're friends. I haven't <laughs> put you on my podcast, but that's gonna happen someday, and, and <laughs> you know, here it is. Um, please go to this con with me. And Baby Boy over here decided to go. And I, I think it was one of the most blessed uh, things I, I had to deal with that weekend because, like, Fred was totally new to the scene, but he just accepted everything and kind of rolled with it. And it was cool kind of getting to see somebody from, from a very, like, you know, I don't want to say cautious, but, like, a very outside perspective looking to to make new experiences and kind of see what the whole culture was about and and fred i i from from what i understood at least enjoyed the crap out of it like we all we all had a really fantastic time oh over i the weekend. no i i fucking loved it like furries are some of the most entertaining people to hang around like nobody gives a fuck at a fur con <laughs> Like everyone is there just like for me for their own specific reasons, but everyone's there to have a good time. And there are very, very, very few people at a convention who are out to make you have a worse time. Like whatever you want to do, like if you want to party, if you just want to like meet people with like a similar interest, like ev it, the vibe is so positive at a convention that like if something goes wrong you know people are there like the the mood picks up again almost immediately it, it's impossible i mean it's certainly possible to have a bad time but like it's it's hard to and i and like like you were saying you know just jumping into it that's just kind of how i do things if if i'm going to experience something i'm just going to jump in head first like there's no reason not yeah. to and that's that's kind of like I, I always say to people, and this this is becoming more of a personal thing. Like I I think it's important to to kind of give everybody a chance, um, <laughs> and specifically like I I I'm so glad to have uh, dragged Fred into a lot of it. Um, what I'm trying to say is that I'm really glad uh, to to see that you know even your video coverage uh, tried to be as as non biased as possible. Obviously, there's a lot that that went on in the video regarding people like you know conflicting personalities and definitely more uh, risky or risque as some people would call it uh, behavior, but. Even before Fred decided to hang out, he was a total trooper and decided to give everybody a fair shake. And it's kind of an interesting study because you look into this culture and it's not too undifferent or it's not too different from a lot of the other like fandoms or like, you know, just groups out there that have their own infighting and their, their own sets of uh, interesting personalities coming out of it, you know? No, I furries are a lot less weird than people make them out to be if... It's just a very particular interest, but I mean, that's true with any fucking group of people. Like, I would I would actually compare furries very closely to um, my understanding of, like, medieval reenactors, which seems like a really weird comparison at first, but there seems to be that <laughs> sort of, um, the same sort of feeling of everyone's just there to, like, have a good time and chill and it all just so happens that they have a common interest and that's what then this is the interest that they've they've decided to congregate around like they're there to party and like get drunk and chill and meet oh, new yeah. people and it's and that's what furry is it's, it's basically like everyone has this common interest but especially for me at this point like if i'm doing something furry it's basically an excuse to like chill with cool people 
Yeah, like like Fred was saying, he couldn't really find necessarily a common group. But furry to a lot of people, it's like kind of some of the most socially awkward people coming together and and forming kind of like those those real close experiences with people you might not even normally have the chance to talk to. Like yeah. when I when I talk to people in the fandom, it's it's always all sorts of different fantastic people. Like I've talked to artists, I've talked to uh, <laughs> people in the army. I've talked to like literal uh astronaut engineers, uh yeah. people people who have created some amazing stuff and just are out there doing all sorts of crazy things. And that's to me, I think one of the most interesting properties of it is just that you you never know what you're going to get out of it and in the same sense there's kind of always this sense of camaraderie that you really can't replicate uh outside of it whenever you gel those people together with a common interest and a desire to just have fun like like i said you know i something kind of peculiar about me is that i don't have a terribly strong sense of identity instead what i try to focus on is having positive experiences and it opens a lot of doors. Identity, to me, is something that feels more like this, like, I am like this, therefore I don't do these kinds of things. But that's so limiting, right? Because yeah. it's really easy to be, like, um, no, these, like, the as part of your identity, you know, like, I am a normal person, therefore furries are disgusting. But that's, like, limiting you from all of, like, the really rad things that can come with that fandom like and you know like i said i'm not deep in the fandom i never will be more than likely like i j just because that's an uncomfortable place for me to be to identify with um with anything that strongly and i don't feel like i need it need that sort of fulfillment that much but i'm but that means that i'm not going to let i'm not letting anything in the way of me experiencing the good parts of it Without And that also allows me, because I'm not identifying as it, I can dismiss the parts that I don't like. And there are plenty of people who do identify as furry that, don't, that, that do dismiss the parts that they don't like. Um, but I guess like it's just sort of a weird paradigm that I've cobbled together. Furry adjacent. And that, that to me is like, I think there's a certain level where it's like, uh, but that doesn't discredit the people who go there because because it's all just a matter of comfort and some people just really like getting comfortable you know and, and feeling like you know they don't have to put on all these extra skins to you know be accepted and and at the end of the day that's all it is it's just people wanting to feel accepted and you know not judged for for what they truly are on the inside yeah i'm really proud and of that term i i'm pretty like was was i the one that coined it i'm not what what term uh furry adjacent Furry Jason. I remember I, describing I mean, myself as that, and like, I, was it you that just like threw their head back and laughed? Yeah, it was something along that line. But like, at, at the end of the day, like, I I think people have become a lot more accepting and and understanding. And like, anytime I talk about it, I'm just candid, and I'm like, yeah, there's all sorts of crap, and that that's with anybody. So oh no, there's <laughs> like, there's tons of shit in the furry fandom. Like, oh, there's, 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 there's some bad sh shit, shit but, anywhere, man. Like, yeah, that that's the problem is wherever, like, whatever community you get yourself involved with, there's going to be bullshit. Like, to, to draw the comparison with um, with medieval reenactors and, like, Ren Fair goers, oh, my fucking God, the stuff that, like, there's some shit that goes on with, like, Ren Fairs and the people involved in them. But, like, if... If you're going to experience the good, you have to be able to work around those bad things. And just have the right kind of judgment and, you know, think for think for yourself when it comes to what should I be involved in? But, you know, at yeah. the end of the day, just, just find what feels comfortable to you and mm -hmm. try to be a good boy. Sorry for talking about furries for, like, what probably has been 15 minutes. <laughs> no, it's it, it's all good. I mean, I, I sort of knew that this was coming. It's all good. I was yeah. prepped. Yeah, and and at, at at that, I I feel like uh, we have reached uh, the conclusion because I don't have any more questions. Well, I do have one question. It's very right. important. Akira has asked, "What are your thoughts on vaping?" Um, <laughs> dab it. Get <laughs> when you vape. When you vape while you are in a call with your friends. When you take a rip, the only way to do it is to get as close as possible to the mic 
so everyone can hear that little clicking so they know that you're vaping. I wanted to thank Fred for coming on this podcast because it's something that like I I really appreciate when any uh, content creator gives me a shot to, to really get more inside of their head. As always with a uh, dope talk, it's been not just about like getting a sense of, you know, oh, this is this is a creator and you know, look at how great they are. It's more like I want to bring them onto a more personal human level cuz like anytime I'm having these conversations with people when they open up and they become like kind of vulnerable, it's always really really wonderful to me you get you get a sense of who someone is and not just like the content they produce and that, there's always that feeling of like when i when i uh, digest someone's content and this this is coming specifically from someone who actually was a huge fan of what fred is i'm, I'm not a fan anymore fred but um <laughs> when i when i used to watch your content uh back i think it was like two years ago like i i never thought to myself i would get to talk to you or you know really get to know you on a personal level but the fact that you were okay with me reaching out and getting to like, you know, do something like this and then taking the time to even, you know, do f stupid things like uh, let's plays and, and whatever else. It just kind of really shows that a lot of a lot of people who create these uh, sorts of content, these videos, all, any of that, they're humans. <laughs> and Fred, in my opinion, is a very good human and it, it's very blessed to have him around. And I just I just really want everyone to know how much uh, I appreciate him and how much uh, other people genuinely appreciate his content. So good Aww. job, Fred. And thanks for you're... being on my podcast. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, you're you're a very good boy. And par part of the reason that I was like willing to keep chatting with you and get to know you was because... Like I, I could recognize that pretty quickly. You're you're a very good boy, and Aww. yeah, you're real chill. It's I'm glad it's, I'm. It, it's it's always really fun chatting with you and hanging out with you. So hell yeah, hear that, guys? Fred thinks I'm cool. Like and subscribe. Comment if you think Fred <laughs> is also cool, and we'll have a one. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm not serious about it. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, he endorses it. Next time on Fred Talk. Uh, but... <laughs> Thanks, thanks, guys. I really want to thank you for for showing up to this and and supporting you know both both me and Fred with your wonderful kind words and your questions that are about vaping and poop. Uh, that, yeah, we, that we, start, we started my... with farts and we're ending on poop. Look, man, everybody poops, and that's the fact of life. Anyway, this this has been dope talk, and I hope you have a wonderful time, guys. Uh, I want to say bye, Fred. Bye, everyone. Thanks for hanging out. Bye, everyone. <laughs>